everybody. Welcome. Um, so I'm a production designer too, like Christoph. So a lot of the stuff I'll be talking about, there's a lot of crossover. Um, you know, I, I production designed the Madagascar movies, all three. And so I'm going to take you back 12 years <laughs> to when we first started um, and, and kind of take you through, you know, how it happened and kind of concentrate a little bit more on, Christoph calls it the Bible, I call it the visual script, but basically it's the same thing. It's visual structure. Um, a bunch of us were talking about different styles of working the other day, and some people are really good at winging it. And I, you know, there's a lot of chaos in the beginning of these things, you know, trying to find what it is that you want to do visually with a movie. And at a certain point, I have to get organized because I feel like, you know, an audience walks away with a sense of a movie. Um, it's a visual medium. And I would rather that they walked away with a movie that I intended, not one that I didn't. So, um, so I'm going to show you also how we kind of visually told our particular story on one, two, and three. I'll probably concentrate mostly on one and then um, go through two and three kind of quickly, even though I think three is the best. Mm -hmm. uh, so, um, you know, maybe some of you have heard this story already, but when we started Madagascar, uh, we had just come off all the Shrek movies. And Shrek was designed to be quite realistic. Shrek the character, Fiona, um, even Donkey were built, you know, Shrek and Fiona were built, built like humans. They had bones and muscle structures and all their rigging and they moved quite naturally and the world was designed quite naturally even though it's a fairy tale world, you know, it still had realistic, kind of a realistic point of view. Um, and at that time, you know, very early in this whole CG animation world, we were people that loved cartoons. We grew up with them. That's why we're in this business. And we were really looking for that vehicle, that script, where we could make a cartoon. And then Madagascar came along, and it was an outrageous slapstick-style comedy. And we just grabbed it. We said, that's it. That's the one. Um, you know, we're up in the San Francisco area. Pixar's right over the bay. They were also developing something called The Incredibles at the same time. I think, you know, that happens in our industry. We kind of feed off each other a little bit. And all of us were kind of on that path to really bring what we loved as kids um, about cartoons into this new medium. So, um, so what we decided, we, we were kind of going for, like I said, what we grew up with as kids in the 60s for me. And um, those films were Tex Avery films. They were Hanna-Barbera films. They were a lot of great Disney films. And we wanted to pull some of those sensibilities. So we looked for a character designer that had that quality. And we found Craig Kelman. This is his self-portrait. He, um, he is a, a character designer and animator that really drew like those guys, you know. He loved those, you know, early illustrators and character designers and animators. But he also had a really great contemporary twist on those. He also designed the Powerpuff Girls and the Samurai Jack characters. And um, so he kind of took what we loved about the old style and brought it into the new age. And that was exactly what we were looking for. Oh, is this not working? Oh, <laughs> Tim. <laughs> oh, so, um, so really, he designed our four lead characters right out of the box. I mean, they changed very little from where those first early sketches that we got. As you can see, you know, the one thing that's changed is that Marty doesn't go on twos, which is still drives me crazy. Um, but uh, basically, the designs of the characters were very much the way he first designed them. Um, 
color. He designed them together as four, which was really important. Um, so, you know, you can see how Melman spots, they changed a little bit. Uh, but other than that, very much the way they were designed. <laughs> Tex Avery from Droopy Dog, very influential to us. Love Tex Avery. Oh. Look, Boo Boo, a smoldering cigarette butt. Our good friend Smokey the Bear will be glad I stamped this one out. Ouch, 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 O U C H, ouch. What? Also, Yogi Bear, very influential. Two whistle, plunk, and boom. Can you even see our curly Q like nostrils on the characters in this? <laughs> and Dalmatians, um, punk how the characters were designed. Straights against C curves became really important to us, and I'll get into that more in detail later. So the other part were golden books, also from this era. Um, you can see the tawny scrawny liney, lion up top, and then the Provinsons, who designed, um, who did a couple of books called Animal Fair, Children's Garden of Verses. I mean, you can really see Alex the Lion in some of those designs. Um, Craig was really influenced by them. Droopy Dog, Yogi Bear, Dalmatians. Um, the, he used to, uh, Craig collected um, he, all the old viewfinder stuff. And you know, back in that day, with 3D characters, there was a concern that um, if we squashed and stretched and pulled those characters around that in 3D it would look really weird, like their bones were breaking. And so we went in with this, with this idea that that, that wasn't gonna happen. And Craig's theory was, if you don't, you know, his line was, if you don't design a realistic looking lion, nobody's gonna expect it to move like one. And that became kind of our mantra. Um, but we had no idea, really, if it was gonna work or not. Um, this is Miroslav Sasek. This is New York, also really influential in the design of the movie. Uh, so the designs of the characters really influenced the design of the entire movie, Ca all the characters in our film and the world. Our characters are built on straights and C curves. Weighted C curves, they don't have to be symmetrical, but everything is, is based this way. And what happens when you connect a curve to a curve instead of a snaky S shape or a straight to a curve is you get these hard transition points and sometimes really hard points. And you'll see um, when we went to our sculpts how those transition points become really hard edges. So, you know, um, Alex the lion has a curved back of the arm and a straight front of the arm and where that meets is a, is a hard edge, almost like Gumby in a way. And we, you know, we went back and forth a lot. Do we round those out? Do we soften it? Is it gonna work? When he twists his arm, is it gonna look like a plasticine Gumby arm twisting? And we decided to keep it in, and it really works well. And yes, you do get some of that, but it's all part of the look of Madagascar. The other thing was extreme proportion. The reason that that's really important to Madagascar is extreme proportion is funny. It looks funny. So, you know, big, round, crazy eyes on a long snout on Melman the giraffe with big teeth at the end is not only funny, but slightly neurotic looking, which really suits his personality. Alex, you know, when we first read the script was incredibly vain, so he has a huge head um, and talks a lot with his hands, so huge hands as well. Um, Gloria was sort of the, the grounded mother of the group, um, but she's a very big body with tiny little hands and feet. So all that also carried through to the world, as you can see just even in the zoo enclosures. That extreme proportion we really wanted to build into the movie for comedy. So squash and, so everything from the design of the characters through to how they moved was, was all part of the plan. 
And we, you know, this is where the collaboration came in with our team, with our riggers and animators. It was so vital to the success of this thing. Um, and like I said, Shrek had bones and muscles, and they had to totally rethink how we built our characters. And really what they came up with was a series of rubber bands. That's all that these characters are made up of, so that they can squash and stretch in all kinds of crazy ways, and it doesn't break the rig. Um, and that, you know, that was back in 2003 or four that we were doing that, and it was really new and exciting. Um, when we first start, when we first saw the facial animation test of Alex, that was kind of the come to Jesus moment. Where is this? really gonna work? Is he gonna look like he's breaking all over the place? And we really pushed him, and it was really one of those aha moments. We just all stood around that monitor going, wow, it's working, I can't believe it. Um, and worked not only great, but we even pushed it farther because it was so much fun. Martin, hey, hold on, I'm gonna kill you, hold up, whoa! Yeah, so that's just an example of what we could do, which we couldn't really do before. Um, so one of the rules that also came out of this was that our characters had stylized shape. They, their graphic patterning, like Marty's stripes, which are basically boomerangs, the graphic patterning was stylized on our characters. And then the surface treatment felt real. So they really feel like they have real fur, even though it's really groomed and clean. Um, they really have real eyes and wet mouths and hoof material on their hooves. But the graphics and the, s and the outward kind of shape was gonna maintain a, s a very graphic point of view. And that we carried through to the world as well, so that we have very you know, designed trees with designed bark pattern, but the bark itself feels real, and the leaves feel waxy or fuzzy like real leaves do. Um, we also did something called the whack factor, which is, um, you know, this was the front of the zoo. It's the entrance to the zoo in Central Park, the clock tower. And, you know, in, you know, in the Shrek world, you, you design it like on the top, very architectural, very real. In Madagascar, we'd push everything around. So there were never, never, I say never, usually, <laughs> there weren't any straight lines. Everything was on an angle or curved. The proportions were always pushed. Um, and that was the idea for Madagascar that it would have that cartoony look throughout. Um, the other thing that happened, and it wasn't planned, was when we got our characters into the jungle of Madagascar, they completely camouflaged themselves and disappeared. You can see them. Um, so it, it, it was really just, it created a, a lighting scenario for us that was really theatrical. It was a spotlight, we threw it on them. Where that light hit was one color, where it fell off was another. In this case, warm where the characters were, and as it fell off, all the surfaces would change to the cool color of the shadow. So it became a very graphic and theatrical point of view that we tried to carry through all the films. So those are our rules in the middle, you know, and they maintained throughout the three films. 50s, 60s cartoon influence, golden books influence, squash and stretch, extreme proportions, straights against curves, <coughs> stylized shapes, stylized pattern, real texture, and the one other thing was theatrical lighting. So then we get into Mad and exactly Mad One and exactly what this particular story was about. Uh, it took place in the Central Park Zoo at the beginning. These were very civilized New Yorkers. Um, a little bit like the Seinfeld characters. That was talked about early in the day. Um, and uh, because we were doing this kind of retro cartoony style, we decided to kind of treat the world a little retro. So we actually went back and looked at the archives of the Central Park Zoo and got all these photographs from that time period. So even though this isn't really what the Central Park Zoo looks like now, a lot of these buildings and the layout is still very similar, but we really did the zoo of the 50s and 60s. And so that's what you see in Madagascar. And then we had the rest of, you know, the, the journey that our characters take through the city as well. 
So we kind of studied that. We, we, you know, we took video, blah, blah, blah. We were there a lot photographing New York City. And then we knew that they were going to land in Madagascar. So there are two worlds, the wilds of Madagascar and New York City. And for Madagascar, our director really wanted us to look at Henri Rousseau, the paintings of Henri Rousseau right down here on the lower right. Um, he loved it, and we did too. And so we really worked at incorporating that into the Madagascar side of uh, our world. There are differences with what he, uh, you know Rousseau was doing as opposed to what we were trying to do. So what what came about was a really cool mix of the two ideas. So you know um, Rousseau has a very primitive point of view and long snaking lines, kind of a naive approach. We changed that and was like straight curve, do do you know, but we still did this sort of layered landscape garden version of Madagascar. We actually never went to Madagascar. We were going to go, but just as we were about to go, there was a political coup. <laughs> um, and <laughs> what's funny is that King Julian is actually kind of based on the person that moved into power. He was, <laughs> he literally was a self-appointed ruler, which is just exactly like Ch King Julian, so we kind of riffed off that. Uh, but we never actually went. But it's been documented really well. So we had a lot of reference we could pull from. Look at that marker on paper. What? Um, so, so here's how I start with visual structure or a visual script. I, you know, whether I have a treatment that kind of lays out the story or a full script, and honestly, I can't quite remember how this went. I think we had maybe a first pass of a script when we did this. But what I do is I sit down with the directors and we go through the story and we plot the dramatics of the story so that when I'm visually telling it or trying to tell it, I want to make sure that I'm hitting those dramatic points visually. Again, so that it's connected to the story and that you as the audience walk away with the feeling that I want you to feel. So this is a very simple graph, and you know it gets a lot complica more complicated as you get in. But our zoo, char zoo characters were New Yorkers. They'd only known the zoo. That was home. So it starts off with them in the zoo in very normal life, and it's the world they're used to and that they know. They are shipped off to Africa, which is a bit of a glitch in their life. But the most dramatic part is really when they hit that beach of Madagascar. And it is revealed as a world kind of like Oz in the Croods, very similar actually, a world that they have, they have no idea what this is. I mean, I think Melman even says, are we in the San Diego Zoo, you know? <laughs> so that's a really dramatic part. And then we have our whole change as our animals change on this island and they have their, all their different growth patterns. Um, and we really wanted to focus on Alex's change because Alex, realizes for the first time that he's a predator, that his best friend is food for him. And that, you know, is a pretty dramatic story. So, so we wanted to really visually sell that. Till we get to the climax, which is the Fusa battle, they win, and they end up in this happy ending place, which is just a little better than normal, a little better than what it was when they started. Um, so that's how we start. And then, um, we start breaking it down. So we had two worlds. We wanted our characters to feel like fish out of water when they hit that beach of Madagascar. We wanted New York to be home. But we wanted New you know, the home and the zoo to be not quite right, really. And so we treated it very rectilinearly. And look, this is like real collaged pieces of paper. I, I, it's weird to go back all these years <laughs> and look at how it used to work, but... Um, so New York, very rectilinear, all man-made materials. If there was any nature in it, it was all very um, groomed, like topiary. Uh, whereas Madagascar, we wanted the full color palette, the full you know um, color wheel of, of color and surface textures and lushness, very different, and curves. 
So the opposite of New York. Uh, so we got more into New York and the palette, the monochromatic palette of New York. We wanted it to be warm. It's brick, predominantly in the zoo, limestone in the zoo, metal, glass, and we wanted to keep it kind of in this range. Um, we also wanted a trapped quality in New York City. So, um, you know, our characters are all in enclosures or cages. Uh, even our, the trees and all the gardens in the zoo in Madagascar have little fences around them, little chain link fences or fences around them. And like I said, they're very groomed. It's all the nature's kind of been sucked out of them. There is no sun, moon, stars, weather in New York. Um, so even if we were doing a scene where it was sunny, the sun would be kind of pushed out behind a building. You'd never quite see it. And there's a moment where uh, Alex and Marty see a star in the sky, and it turns out to be a helicopter. I don't know if you remember that. But we don't have any nature. We tried to suck nature out, really, so that we could pour it into Madagascar. Um, and also, anything like even pigeons flying around the city, they never actually got out. They're always trapped by the walls of New York City. So even the leaves on our trees in New York were rectilinear or straight edged, whereas in Madagascar they were all curved. This is a key um, of the zoo, and you can see all those ideas here. The zoo is completely walled in by New York City. Very little sky is exposed. You do see a little of the reflections of the windows. Um, and you can see the color palette here too, quite monochromatic and muted. Again, walled in by the city. So these are all keys, these are all paintings from uh, the film. This is when we first see the penguins and you can see the sun tucked behind the building there. We did drafting then, so we actually drafted the set, you know, on paper. <laughs> it's crazy. Um, again, paintings of New York City. So these keys that you're seeing, you know, back in that at that time, we did keys um, just before a, a sequence went into production. Predominantly now, we don't. We wait for camera to shoot our rough previs sets, and we'll choose some keys from those, and then they come back to art, and we'll paint over the actual set with some of the preliminary lighting, and then that goes to the lighting department for them to match. But back in the, at this time, we didn't do that. It's in the subway. Yeah, we did have to get used to it, but you know, it's actually, it's easier, and it's more accurate for the lighting department, um, and more efficient. Um, so, you know, it's sort of that, it's a bit of a play because, you know, a lot of these people that we have in our art department are incredible painters and, and do great composition. So what we usually do is we'll do like the big conceptual pieces first with the set, with the overall lighting for a sequence. Then that sequence, this, we'll do a, a rough previous set like Christoph was showing, those, those rough crude sets. That will go to layout that puts the camera in and the rough characters and, and really creates the shots. And then from that we'll pick that, we'll pick those key shots, bring them back to art and apply what we did in those conceptual paintings to those shots. It just, it, it's just more efficient, really, and more accurate. It helps everybody in production. It's much clearer. Yeah. Um, Marty in Times Square, at the um, train station. And then, of course, Madagascar, which we love, is full with, you know, Drug trips, really, hallucinations, <laughs> you know, crazy, you know, starving dreams. Um, so we, uh, you know, I'm a big Michelle Gondry fan, and I got to geek out on that with this. So that's what this, uh, this is about. It's fun. Uh, so uh, the, the Zoosters get 
you know, you saw on the graph, the zoosters get shipped off to Africa. And um, we wanted them to still stay in this kind of man-made world. So the ship, we also made very monochromatic, all man-made materials, blah, blah, blah. But the one thing we started to add or introduce was curves, and it's re it really comes from the water. So we're kind of, te you know, this isn't stuff, I, I would hope the audience isn't sitting there and going, oh, you know, look, there's curves in the water. <laughs> but th it's just a feeling I hope that they're taking away. So, so that was introduced um, in this scene. But you can see how monochromatic, again, it was overcast and gray. We wanted to keep it that way for the ship sequence and uh, our guys in their crates, again, still monochromatic. Uh, but the curve of the water being introduced, which sort of foreshadows Madagascar. So then we get to Madagascar, all upward bursting shapes, um, every color of the rainbow, and uh, tons of texture and surface variety. Um, again, just showing what that is. And then how, like for instance, leaves in Madagascar are very different from our leaves in New York City. A lot of curves, but curves against straights. Lots of weather, lots of you know sunshine. We see the moon, we see the stars. Um, and this is sort of indicative of that first shot where they see the world of Madagascar very different from what they're used to in New York City. Um, then these are, you know, this is the world of mad. Uh, again, you can see the spotlight effect. These are all paintings again, key paintings from the movie. Spotlights in different forms. Julian didn't have a hat at first. He doesn't really even look like himself. Or lemurs. Again, lemurs all designed on that st same straights against curves idea. All the characters were. Madagascar full of curves. Melman's grave. <laughs> Tiki. Marty's Tiki Hut. Again, retro kind of ideas in our design. Another crazy hallucination. <laughs> 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 this is where Marty sees his kind of version, the real version of his mural at the zoo. King Julian on his throne. Um, and then what we did for that change that you saw as Alex changes and realizes that he starts getting hungry, really, and he doesn't know what to do about it, and it's, it kind of messes with his mind. So we, we just, all we did was we, we turned our plants upside down. We, we weep them, and we pulled out, you know, color a little bit. So you'll see, and introduced god rays, actually, for the first time, our atmosphere, which we don't have in Madagascar. Madagascar is very graphic and crisp. We don't use atmosphere. Um, and then as it got worse and worse, the, we introduced like sharpness and cactus and those kinds of plants. So here's some images. This is that wonderful world image as they're walking through, realizing what's happening to Alex. And you can see some of these ideas here where the ducky gets eaten. <laughs> <laughs> this is the beach, back on the beach. And then, um, you know, in Madagascar, there's these incredible rock formations called the Singi. And when you look at some of those photographs, it looks like a post-apocalyptic New York. And we're like, yes, oh, that's such a bonus. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> like when Alex totally loses it, he, he walls himself off in the, in the Singi and creates a kind of zoo enclosure for himself in this kind of post-apocalyptic New York. It was so awesome. He loved it. So this is that idea here. Um, he's afraid of himself at this point and what he's going to do. And then these are just some of uh, our other character designs in the movie. I just wanted to show you again. You can see all the straights and curves and um, exaggerated proportions on these guys. Yeah. Yeah. Had you heard any of the voices? Um, to, to, 
So. Or well, you're just riffing on what the, the, the dialogue line. Um, there was a combination of both, but for King Julian, he actually. So we designed these lemur crowds, which you see all through Madagascar, and you can see that's the original design of the ringtail crowd character. So what we did was we just when he. Came, what happened was Sasha Baron Cohen came into the recording studio and was so unbelievable that they raised his character to more of a lead. He was just brilliant. You can't use half of what he recorded, but <laughs> yeah, it's incredible. But, um, but so we took a crowd character, a generic lemur, and we just pulled it. We pulled him around. And he, so he kind of looks like Sasha Baron Cohen. He has some proportional similarities, but he was basically a generic character that we just messed around with. Yeah. So I think we knew about Chris Rock when Marty was designed, but I don't know if, and, and uh, Gloria went through so many different people. Originally she was J-Lo. And her design, we had a huge butt on her. <laughs> we did, but you know, when she turned around, her tail was here, which means that half of her body was like a butt crack. <laughs> <laughs> it was unbelievable, so we had to change it. it I, c I couldn't live with it. Everybody else seemed to be fine, but I couldn't live with it, <laughs> so we changed it. Um, but then Gwen Stefani was gonna be the voice of Gloria for a while, and then Madonna for a while until it finally got to Jada Pinkett Smith. Um, so she went through a lot of different voices. She was not designed on any character. Um, I don't think we knew about Ben Stiller either. And I don't think we knew about David Schwimmer either, actually, in the very beginning. I think the characters were mostly designed before those guys. And really, Marty the Zebra looks like Craig. You know, that drawing is really Marty the Zebra, in a way. So, sometimes we do, sometimes we don't. Yeah. I remember we have a deleted uh, project from Disney called Wildlife when you have this hippo that was supposed to be a trapezer. Yeah. So, no wonder that got, they got rid of it. But yeah. Gloria uh, Oh, really? Yeah. Did that, was that the film that became The Wild eventually? The wild. Yeah. That is Yeah. Shady. Yeah. Uh, you know, and of course, a uh, major source of interest is uh, Mary Blair for the genre. Yeah. She was influential for us too, and of course. And for the vegetation, even mm. um, it was longer. Mm -hmm. And you know, Sleeping Beauty is mm. uh, like a deal. Uh, it's so there, but it's wonderful the way he's given the well, beautiful form of the actual Yeah. It's, we're all, it's an incestuous world, this animation world. Yeah. Because uh, literally, I am totally influenced by all those artists. I mean, you'll even see in Matt 2, Ivan Earl comes in big time. Um, Mary Blair always. Um, so, Tyrus Wong. I actually worked on a project that was killed at DreamWorks that was all watercolor. And we just, oh, Tyrus Wong, talk about an amazing artist. Anyway, yeah, we used him as an influence for that a lot. For the first version of the crew, it's an impressionistic style. That yeah. I don't know how to get there with 3D. Because it's so painful. Well, that's the challenge, right? We're so early in this CG process. There's so much we could do. Yeah, so we can keep going. Yeah. Anybody have any questions so far? Are we good? Okay, so Mad 2. So we went from this really dense jungle of Mad 1 to a horizon line. Like, how am I going to do that? You know, what, what, is any, what is the correlation between these two worlds? Well, you know, luckily for me, um, Sasek, actually, Miroslav Sasek, who did This Is New York, also did you know all these books on all, uh, places all over the world, and so that was really great inspiration for more open spaces for me and how to treat that in that same kind of 60s style. We actually did go to Africa this time, and it was a huge influence on 
how the film looked. And I think the biggest influence was the color palette and the big sky. Um, so we decided, you know, Madagascar was, ended up being a very primary color palette and we really wanted to change that for Mad 2 and get a little more sophisticated with our, our palette. Um, so that had a huge influence on that. And then the landscape. And also for me, um, so big skies and like you, these are paintings that were done by Yuriko Ito in our art department. Big skies and a difference in our palette, which we w really wanted to play with. Um, and then African design. I felt like when I was there, I saw it everywhere in the branches of the trees and the bark of the trees and in the patterns in the grass. And so we really used, and also African design was really influential in the design of the 50s and 60s in furniture and architecture and ceramics and all that stuff. And so it was really great inspiration for us for Mad 2. Um, so you can see these are, you know, surfacing pages for our acacia trees. The, the design of the tree, very straights against curves like we've always had, but the bark patterns were very influenced by African design. And you can see it in a lot of this stuff. I'll just click through it here. Even in our grass patterning, even in our cracked mud, everything uh, in uh, the world of Africa. So. So for us in MAD2, Africa, you know, on a macro scale was very, very simple, which is very different from Madagascar. But on a micro scale, it was very designed and very complex. So the grass, you know, had, you know, hundreds of varieties. You know, so did the dirt, so did the leaves, so did the trees. So that's where all our detail came in. So this is the... Um, visual script for MAD 2, um, kind of a similar trajectory to MAD 1 in that we crash land in Africa after we've left Madagascar. Our characters, you know, meet their families. Um, Alex meets his parents. Uh, they all connect with their, you know, Melman meets all the giraffes and Marty meets the zebras and Gloria the hippos. So they all connect, which is really great at the watering hole at the top there. Then the watering hole dries up, and that's sort of where things start to go downhill. So you can see how our color palette is changing, how we go from curves in the first part to more straight edges as we come down. Um, we end up, you know, into the jungle where, um, you know, Granny ha is creating all kinds of problems, and we have, we end with kind of Melman in this volcano sacrifice scene. Um, and that's probably the worst moment. He's about to throw himself into the volcano to get water back. Um, then we have, you know, a battle where they, you know, capture Granny uh, and everything's good at the end. So we're back to the watering hole, water comes back, flowers bloom, grass is green, everything's great again. Uh, so we have a ticking clock through this movie, um, which we really wanted to emphasize. And I'm going to just take you through again some of the art for this to show you, you know, again, this is where we first crash land. And you can see based on that, that the palette and the roughness of this area, we really wanted to enhance when they first crash in Africa. Even the, the trees are leafless and all their branches are exposed. We would use the same trees in the rest of the, the film, but leaf them. Um, so they're much more beautiful later. <coughs> Ooh, that's tiny, but that's where the penguins and monkeys are rebuilding the plane. This our guys negotiating contracts. Um, again, dry, arid Africa. <laughs> Crazy penguins. It's <laughs> 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 where they first see the watering hole with all the animals. That's home in our movie, really important. This was an early Viz Dev piece of that same image. Marty meets <laughs> the zebras. Um, these also are very early Viz Dev images to sort of show you camouflage of the Zebras, giraffe area, lion rock, baobabs, Julian riding his ostriches. 
the jungle. Again, you can see a lot of African patterning through here as well. Um, plane, flying machine, we call it. Dry, you know, water's dried up here. He's wearing the hat of shame. This is early vis dev for the volcano sequence and where, you know, uh, Melvin's about to jump. <laughs> and the end. Uh, always at sunset, <laughs> because that's really beautiful. <laughs> <laughs> and these are some of the characters in Africa. Moto Moto, you know, Gloria's love interest, very important. Father, mother, and some of the evil lions in the group. Okay, so Mad 3, uh, traveling movie. <laughs> Much different than what we had been to before. Back to a very urban landscape, again, different. We had many places we were traveling, Monte Carlo, Rome, the Alps, and London. Um, and like uh, Christoph said, we really wanted to feel the travel, so each place was treated very differently uh, visually so that you felt like you were moving from one place to another. Um, Monte Carlo was very 60s James Bond kind of influenced. We were looking at old 60s Grand Prix posters and kind of based it off that. You can see actually one on the top left there. That's, that was really inspirational for us in Monaco. Um, Rome, warm, textural, no straight lines, lots of you know curvy roads and winding roads. Alps is where our characters really find themselves. So we wanted this kind of open amphitheater that opened them up to the sky where when they were on the trapeze and on the high wire, you really felt them against the sky, like anything was possible for them. So that was important for that location. And London, we kind of wanted to treat it like a pinstripe suit. So um, those were our locations. We also had uh, what we called a bad circus, a circus that they buy and then realize is um, not great. So we wanted to treat that visually one way. It's under one big top. And then their reinvented circus, which um, you know we started developing that thing four years before we actually figured out what it was gonna be. So these are some early ideas um, on what, and you can see some kind of carried over and some did not at all. Uh, we had a circus train as well, um, exterior and interior, and a train that, that also got train, uh, changed partway through the movie. They painted it and updated it. We also had human characters that were really important, big characters for the first time which was really fun for us. Um, Chantelle Dubois was, was really, really fun for us. Um, and a whole new variety of zoo characters as well. All of them based on the same roles that we had always had for Madagascar. Um, you know, whenever, <laughs> the great thing about doing sequels for me is Whenever you do a movie, I don't know if you guys do this, but I, I always go, oh, if I had the chance to do it again, I'd change this or I'd add that. And so this is always, <laughs> every film was that opportunity for me. And so in Mad 3, we decided to really look at Miroslav Sasek again. And we wanted to really get hand-drawn quality into our world. So, so we worked on that. And so our buildings have a little bit more of a hand-drawn quality and not this just hard, clean whack factor that we had at the beginning of the MAD franchise. Um, so that's reflected here in some of these building designs. Um, Tadahiro uh, Isegi, the illust Japanese illustrator, um, we looked at for uh, loss of detail as you went back in space so that you know, where our characters were, where the action took place, we really wanted it to be detailed. But as you went back in space, we would really simplify our models, simplify the surfacing and the lighting so that things really fell off atmospherically, but in a very graphic designed way, as opposed to just a very complex model that's lit with atmosphere, you know, it just has atmosphere over it. So it was part, kind of graphically, what we wanted to do. And then lighting was different in this film, too. Um, and again, it came from Tadahiro a little bit, where he does a transition, a color transition between light and shadow um, that we really loved. And you can see that here as well. 
texture was really important. Not realistic texture, but almost like a silk screen that skipped kind of texture across everything. We had that throughout the movie as well. So this is the visual structure graph for MAD3. And as you can see, um, let me just show you this. So MAD1's at the bottom, MAD3 at the top. You know, this was an action-packed film. It was up, it was down, it was up, it was down, it was up, it was down. Um, and I think you feel that in the movie. It feels very fast and moving and exciting. And we really wanted to reflect that visually. So when it was bad, it was usually Dubois that was making it bad. And um, how we did that was we treated Dubois specifically very film noir. Um, so wherever, whenever she comes into a situation, the lighting changes, the angles get much more dramatic. Um, red is her color for danger. So remember when you first see her, she arrives out of the smoke and fire. Um, so we, we, we kind of played with that idea. So whenever it was negative, you'd kind of move into this scenario. Even with Vitali, when he's struggling, jumping through the hoop, it has this feeling as well. Color scripts come out of this visual structure for me. I always start with the first and it develops into what the color script for the movie would be. This is a very graphic way of doing it. You can do it much more detailed. There's all different kinds of color scripts. This was easier for us because it was a little more flexible. Story changes happen a lot, as Christoph was saying, and you can really play with it when it's this simple to kind of make sure it's working for your movie. Yeah. How what? Well, <laughs> yeah, that's really interesting that you would say that. I think, you know, as we're developing it, we're so close to it as we're developing it that we know exactly what all this <laughs> means. <laughs> so if I have an artist say, that, you know, that, that I want them to go on to that last image there, that's the train going off into um, the distance at the very end of the movie. And so this is also, we have this, but we also have the boards. And often we'll have a previous shot. So it's sort of the combination of elements, and they'll apply it. Does that make sense? Yeah. OK. <laughs> is it time, time to wrap up? <laughs> so these are, I'm just going to again take you through some of the art of MAD3. So this was the, you know, we have a lot of t uh, Twilight Zone references in MAD, which I, and this is one of those. So this is uh, Monte Carlo. You can see that the palette, we stayed really true to the original design. This is in the casino. This is Dubois' reveal. These are shots from her getting ready to um, go after our characters. Very film noir. This is the crash, kind of complex and chaotic there. So this is where they meet the, the uh, circus animals for the first time. And again, this was a little bit, again, uh, like walking into a new world and wanting to expo expose it, like Madag the beach of Madagascar. Um, so we wanted them to walk in, get into this train in the dark, not knowing what they were getting into, and then have Stefano's lantern light up this sort of gypsy caravan crazy space. These are just um, vis dev images of the train. The Master of Ceremonies car, where Alex learns all about the history of the circus and Vitali the tiger. The King of Versailles, after they've bought the circus, without really knowing what it is. Uh, Rome, the love story with Julian and the bear in Rome. <laughs> uh, the Colosseum that houses the initial circus that's inside the Colosseum. Backstage, it's all very exciting. It's going to be good. It's going to be great. Oh. And then... It's not so great. So we really needed the palette, dusty, problems. 
This is Rome. Rome again, still that warm palette. Uh, love story on the train. Going to the Alps, then the Alps. And that's that amphitheater idea and the palette like we had established earlier. Open to the sky, anything can happen. The train gets changed. They do a paint job and turn it to fur power. Vitali has his moment. Um, jumping through the rings. So this is uh, thumbnails kind of, of of what that scene would be. The reinvented circus tent in London. Um, how they painted themselves as well backstage. And then the new circus. Um, you know, how we got to this, oh, I can't, I get, how did we get to it? We went through a lot, years of trying to figure out what would our characters do with a new circus? Like, who are they? And it just became, we, it just, we just wanted it to be spectacular and colorful and so, and a <coughs> lot of fun. And, and that's really just how it ended. Do you have a thesis that Dumbo's Yeah. Yeah, hugely influential to us, yeah. We like to tip our hat to stuff a lot. <laughs> and also the train is so close to yeah. Junior. To Dumbo? To, to Junior. Oh, yeah. Or yeah. Actually, it's a heritage. Yeah, for sure. Um, so this is where Dubois shows up at the zoo, so you can see we're back to the Dubois um, film noir palette. And then the zoo arrives, this sort of aerial version of it to save the day in New York City. It's our characters. Is there gonna be a Mad Four? I guess we'll wait and see. <laughs> is there any, any questions? Yeah. Uh, just, I'd just like to ask, where did the script and story body come into? Like for example, do you do you think of a of like this great uh, circus scene and then have the storyboard uh, have the storyboard work after that scene fill in the blanks in between the big scenes? You know, um, it goes back and forth. And in fact, that version, that last version of the good circus was really, uh, it, it, we actually had a big, by the end we had a big brainstorming session with the directors, story, and art. And um, I collected a lot of reference of what I liked and what I thought each of the characters should do in the circus. And Tim Heights, who's one of our lead story artists, brought ideas in board form. And then the directors, you know, we actually took things like, we just had pieces of paper and Tom McGrath, who's one of our directors and also the voice of Skipper, he, he just cut a spiral in the piece of paper and stretched it for, you know, we have that big ramp in the new circus that opens up. And it was just like a lot of ideas like that that we were brainstorming and really within a, a, the period of like three hours, we all came up with this idea. And then it developed from there as we got into the computer and started working with the effects artists and animators and, um, so it was kind of a combination of stuff I'd been thinking about over the years and what story brought and what the directors brought and we all just brainstormed together at the end. So the directors are, and story are involved in every step of the way. And so when we create that visual script in art, it's incredibly flexible, you know. W story's changing all the time and in fact in Madagascar often three months before that thing gets released, we're still changing the story. It's, it, it's pretty challenging, but hopefully it all fits still within that idea. It's just little changes that are happening, but um, story has a huge influence. We, and in the early days, they're the first on and we're the first on, and we have a lot with the directors. So we have a lot of relationship and working back and forth on ideas. We influence each other a lot, yeah. Uh, 
Um, so often, well, for me, in my experience, it, the directors come in with a vision for their film. They've been developing it, so, um, so they usually have a vision. Then I just kind of riff off it. I, I start with, so for Mad, uh, Eric Darnell really wanted the Henri Rousseau jungle. So that's what he brought to it, and the idea that we wanted to make a cartoon. Now, how that resolved itself was really my job. Like, how do, what are we gonna really do? You know, how, how is that gonna work and play out and visually, what does that become? So, yeah, usually there's a, a vision from a director, hopefully, and then you kind of grow from there. Yeah. Yeah. On Madagascar, that wasn't the case. But I know right now on Dragon, they're working on two and three at the same time, right? Um, which is a kind of great idea. Uh, but that's the first time that's really happened. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Always. So, you know, when we do these presentations, it always looks really clean and perfect. You know, <laughs> this went so smoothly. It, it doesn't. All through the process, there's changes or, or somebody doesn't like a direction you're going or, or the story changes or, or part of the tone of the story changes and you need to adjust. I think really one of the important tools when you're going into this business is flexibility. To really not only to be willing uh, to be open to change and then to be able to think on your feet as far as you know taking hold of it again and what you want it to be now that this change has occurred and i think you know what christoph showed was an example of that it was really challenging for him to you know he had designed this movie in a specific way there was this huge note and it's like, okay, you just have to take it again and hunker down and feel like, like, how can I still feel happy about how that's gonna go? Yeah, flexibility is huge. Yeah. Just wondering about uh, time frame uh, for the color boards for, um, I know it's a sliding scale, but yeah. how would you allow yourself for something quite rudimentary as opposed to something quite polished um, as far as you know, locking up the frame of the film, like some of the stuff there? Like some of those keys. Um, well, like a thumbnail. Sometimes thumbnails are, are perfectly fine. Um, so what happens more and more, I would say, is that we don't, you know, for Mad One, we did all these like really intense keys for many, many shots in every sequence. And I think really what we do more than ever now is we'll do a few establishing shots for a sequence, one or two, and then the rest can be thumbnails. And timeframes of those? You're just loose? Um, it depends how many people we have on working on a sequence. Often there will be two, like a lead and a support. Um, it can, you know, so if we're going into like the zoo for the first time, not only are you doing the keys for the upper t that first sequence, but you're also designing the whole zoo. The sequences that come after that for the zoo are just the keys and maybe an additional prop or two, so they're much faster. But sometimes it can take 12 weeks to do a first, you know, a first sequence in a first set, and then after that it can be anywhere from, you know, it can be three weeks. Um, so it all depends. Does that help? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, what's a typical day for you? It changes. So I'm one of the first people on the show with director, producer, head of story usually. Um, these things take four years approximately. So uh, when I first come on, you know, it's that blue sky time, that dreaming time. I get to actually draw and paint, sit at my drawing table, or you know, work on Photoshop, and it's 
really great, at, you know, finding that. And then you start bringing on your team and, you know, you start overseeing more, more and more. So about a year, year and a half in, that's when it starts heading into production and into the pipeline. It goes out of the art department, really, and starts going through all the departments like modeling and surfacing and lighting and effects and uh, clothing and hair and, you know, all these other departments where you are overseeing the look of the film to make sure your vision is going to make it onto the screen. So sometimes, you know, I'll look at my, I get a printout of my schedule and it's like, every half hour, 18 meetings in a row. So I have to close my door and lie down on my floor and go, okay, you can do this. <laughs> you know? um, so it changes. It, it, it really changes over the four years, which is really lovely because you don't get bored with anything. It's all really interesting and diverse. So you'd like, do you do your own personal work outside of working? Yeah. You know, I'm a mom. So I feel like, you know, I'm busy outside of work, but yes. Um, I also teach an art class to kids on the weekends and um, I'll sit and draw and paint with them too. And um, so yeah, for sure, y you need to, I think, to sort of, you know, that's where, that's why you got into it. And it that's who you are and I think it's important to maintain that, yeah. Uh -huh. yeah. Yes. Um, it usually it's like that. Uh, sometimes they get, uh, again, they have to be flexible. If a change comes in, all of a sudden that sequence got pulled. We're not doing it, you know, and they're, they're onto something else. But yeah, they, they usually get put on a sequence for a film and, and need to design it and design all the elements of it. Our, uh, most of the artists in our art department are really flexible, uh, stylistically as well as the kind of work they do. So they need to be able to draw and paint, they need to understand light, they need to be able to design props and surface textures. It's really great if they know 3D, know Maya. Uh, After Effects, is, we use that more and more, um, yeah. But, but usually they're focused on a task for a period of time, yeah. Can I jump in there real quick? Sorry, yeah. I beg your pardon, Kendall. No, There's going to be time for questions for everybody with all four um, of our DreamWork guests at 3 p.m. as well. So perhaps some of those questions can wait till then, if, if that's okay, because yeah, we... Yeah, great. You hungry? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> we've got to take a break. So that was... Thanks, thanks so much. That was brilliant. Yeah, thanks, you guys.